So this conversation series is a partnership of the Research Centre for Deep History and the Centre for Environmental History at the Australian National University. I'm Ruth Morgan, I might have met some of you before, and I'm co-convening the event today with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Laura Rademacher. Now, before I introduce the chair of today's deep conversation, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose unceded lands I'm honoured to live and work and on whose lands host the ANU. I'd also like to acknowledge, celebrate and pay my respects to the elders past and present of the many different countries and places from where all of our speakers and our participants are joining us today. Today, we meet to explore telling history through country. And I'm delighted to introduce to you Associate Professor Reby Taylor from the University of Tasmania, who will be chairing this morning's discussion. As many of you will know, Reby is an ANU alumna and an award-winning historian who has published widely on Tasmanian Aboriginal or Palawa history, colonial and genocide studies, and most recently on the histories of European imperial extinction discourses and of Indigenous cultural resistance and resurgence. And she's currently working very hard on writing The Women at the Edge of the World, Surviving Extinction, which will be published by Black Ink very soon. So I'm going to hand over chairing to Reby and she'll take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, welcome, everyone. Woman uh, Jaka. Ya um, Yes, my name's Reby. I am a non-Indigenous historian. I was born in England. I came to Australia when I was five to Ghana country, Adelaide. I began by saying woman Jaka because this means hello, welcome in Wurundjeri language. And I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri country, part of the Kulin Nation of Victoria. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri traditional owners on whose unceded land I have the privilege of living. I also said, Ya Pulingana. And that means hello, welcome in the Tasmanian Aboriginal reconstructed language, Palawakani. Behind me is a picture of Front Beach uh, on Cape Barren Island or Truana, which is an important cultural home for Tasmanian Aboriginal Palawa or Pakana community members in the Bass Strait. It's been an honour to work with Palawa community members now for about 20 years in my research. And I acknowledge the Palawa as the original and continuing custodians of their island, Lutrawita, and I pay my respects to their elders of the present and the past and emerging. And it's an honour to chair today's uh, Deep Conversations Telling History Through Country. We have five uh, speakers whom I'll introduce in a moment, and they'll speak for a total of 40 minutes, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions from the floor. You can post your questions at any time using the chat. Um, and I can see at the moment the chat's a busy place um, where people are doing that wonderful and emerging positive practice of acknowledging the country that they're on right now. So keep that going. That's wonderful to see. And it's uh, no more relevant than in a webinar titled Telling History Through Country. I want to take a moment to think about those three compelling words, telling, history and country. Telling suggests a move away from writing history. And today we're going to hear about innovative ways of communicating histories, including oral histories, using film and other multimedia. And today's speakers are all historians. They are practitioners of a discipline with its own history. How history is told is always changing. Now, not so long ago, historical research just almost exclusively meant engaging with the written texts, with the written record. Increasingly, uh, engagement with post-colonial theory, feminist and Indigenous studies increasingly led historians to question what and who was missing from that written record, to listen for silences and to research beyond the record, written record into, to carry out oral and community-based history research and to consider place, landscapes, buildings and objects as historical records. And today we continue that shift away from the record to consider country and what it can tell us. Country without the determiner the. The country signifies a non-Indigenous notion of land beyond a city. It is also a way of talking about the nation. Country with a capital C is what journalist, Indigenous journalist Jack Lattimore recently explained is important to remember that capital C because it conveys the philosophical and spiritual cosmology 
and space-time continuum of First Nations people's notions of country. That's why we capitalise it, he wrote, same as you probably do with God. So a country is huge. It's everywhere. It's where you are right now. Country has a millennia deep history, but it is living in the present. Country then connects the past to the present. So how might history be told through country? In what ways might country speak? These are compelling questions posed on today's webinar flyer, and they make me ask more questions in turn. How can historians of Australia begin to understand history without engaging with country? And by doing what that necessarily involves, engaging, consulting, sitting down with traditional owners and listening. For as today's webinar cogently states, country is more than the backdrop for history. It is an active participant within both its stories and their telling. I look forward to hearing today's speakers explore what this means, what this statement means in relation to their research with Indigenous histories. So let's meet the speakers. Laura Nabaka is a descendant of the Wankamara Murawira people, Anjimathanya, the Kuma and Gunja, and the Ghana Barkanji. Lorena is an oral historian and filmmaker, and she teaches history at the University of New England, uh, UNE. Welcome, Lorena. <laughs> Michael Brogan uh, is a Butchila Waka Waka scholar. Michael's currently enrolled in a PhD in creative practice at UNE. Michael's cross-disciplinary research is consistent with his professional teaching experience and industry-based practices in visual and performing arts. Welcome, Michael. Eliza Kent is an independent researcher. She's supported Aboriginal-led research projects at UNE. She has a PhD in history from the University of Melbourne and has published research on early modern witch hunts. Welcome, Eliza. Anne McGrath. Anne is the W.K. Hancock Distinguished Professor at the School of History at the ANU. She's the Director of the Research Centre for Deep History and the current Kathleen Fitzpatrick Laureate Fellow. Anne's influential and acclaimed publications include Born in the Cattle Aborigines in Cattle Country and Illicit Love, Interracial Sex and Marriage in the United States and Australia. Welcome, Anne. And Peter Reid, adjunct professor at the School of History at the ANU. Peter's research on stolen generations changed the face of Australian history profoundly. It shaped a new national story that continues to challenge and inform politics and history making. Welcome, Peter. And it's over to you, Peter, uh, to offer the first presentation in this conversation. Uh, just begin by unmuting your mic. Thanks, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Ruby. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, as Peter Reid from Munawal country in Canberra and the greatest respect to uh, Indigenous elders past, present and future, particularly my dear friend Artie Matilda. Um, so we're talking about my experience with country just for 10 minutes. And I've been looking at country since long before. Um, I was out of short pants virtually, but when I was 10 years old, I was wandering around the country wondering about the human uh, factor in there. And it wasn't really until probably about nine, my 1930s or something, I started traveling around country <clears throat> with people who'd been associated with it, which is which um, doubles the benefit from my, my knowledge of it. And I hope it's a benefit to other people going back, because often they don't have an opportunity to go back uh, to country. I don't, I don't mean only indigenous people, but people in general who don't go back and bring back a lot of memories, sometimes sadness, but they work through that too. So just two quick examples of what I've learned from traveling uh, around country. And both these instances are taken from a project, the history of Aboriginal Sydney. That's it's an online project. It's called History of Aboriginal Sydney, that's all one word, .edu.au. And uh, so these are just very poor stills I'm going to show you from today, but they're all, they're all on video and you'll hear um, the, my two speakers today um, uh, speaking about it on, um, on video as well. So if we, if we have a look at that first picture, please, very small though it is, please. Um, and I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm started talking about, there we are, uh, so on the left there is Uncle Gordon, Uncle Gordon Briscoe, known to, known to many of us probably. Um, he was did a PhD here and uh, was known as the King of Redfin for quite quite a few years before that. So I said to I said to Michael Gordon, I'd love to exp explore your city from when you were here. So we spent a, a number of days doing that, partly going up and down um, uh, the streets of Redfin, looking at the Empress Hotel and where that had been and the, where, where the medical centre started and so on. But also, um, then we went out to where he'd been as a child. He was taken away from his family in the early 1940s with his mum. Uh, first placed in Balaclava, came from Alice Springs, Balaclava, and then uh, got off the train at Central, where there's a plaque now, where it says, this is where the Aboriginal kids who got off the train from Adelaide were placed, They're all lined up here, right, you mob of Catholics, you're Anglicans, you're Presbyterians. Uncle Gordon was designated Anglican, and then we were sent to Mulgoa, which is on the uh, western, uh, just on, not far from the Hawkesbury, western Sydney. And we walked around there, looked at the church and so on, and then said, okay, we'll show you where my home was. But we couldn't do it. We, first of all, he was a bit worried about the priest coming out and uh, hunting us away. We crawled in the back way. And there's over this very large area that I can see on my left there, where the original home for the, uh, the Mulgoa kids was. You can't see it. He could recognize it because he could work it out from where the trees were. Later on, I, was, I discovered you could see it from Google Earth. You can see the outline of it, but you can't see it in any other way. Now, the point is, Gordon was able to say something he'd never said before. And he says it on tape. He says it beautifully. I've, I've quoted it on a number of occasions. I do suggest you look it up on the website. He says, look, I can come back here. And the real tragedy is you fellas, you white fellas always apologizing, but you never ask us what we want you to apologize for. And that's this, this bit of country here. I can't get onto it without getting special permission, even though it's just church land not used for anything. Secondly, there's no sign of anything that was ever here. All those Aboriginal kids that lived here, there's no sign that we were ever here in the first place. Thirdly, <clears throat> and most importantly, I can't take my kids back here and show them this is what we were, because there's nothing here. It, our history has been erased and I can't get it back and I can't show my kids that this was the central tragedy of my life when I come back here is that I can't pass on this history in the way that other, other people can because it's been obliterated. Right, well, there's one story. Um, and I'll just go quickly on to one other one. If you look on the right hand side there, there's Uncle Gordon Morton, Durrock man. And we're out at the site of the Blacktown, the Blacktown Native Institution. Started by Golden Macquarie in 1814 at Paramount, it moved out here a couple of years later. And it whereupon it became a dairy farm and uh, not used for anything in particular, so apart from grazing. It's in the area where she's actually standing. Um, there's a lot of sort of concrete blocks and things in there. There was a house built. Um, one of the missionaries which stood until 924 when it was burnt down and I went there, I've been, I've been there a number of times, particularly with Uncle Gordon because he remembers in particular um, uh, spending a lot of time there. He actually grew up in, in Plumpton on, on the old, uh, uh, he had a long, long history there. His family lived on the old police paddock uh, just near the station there and uh, the actual house, it's, we couldn't go there unfortunately, we we're very close to where the, the one steel factory is, you can just see it in the distance, but the entrance to his farm was just, just by the station. Anyway, this, the point about this, this place is that it, at the time that photograph was taken, it wasn't in direct hands, but now it is. And at this point, we're getting into complications. In a sense, Uncle Gordon's the easy one. Okay, there it was. We can do something about it. Bad white fellas should be assigned there. Maybe they will one day and we can be rectified. But as soon as, as everybody knows here, as soon as you're working in contemporary history, you're getting into politics. And that, um, that land has been the granting, the rest, restitution of that land back to the Durak people who all 
those people there, well, practically everybody, I think, has connections with, with that Blacktown institution itself, um, has been opposed in, by, in various parts. Um, once by the Blacktown, at, at times by the Blacktown Council, at times by other, other um, groups of um, civic authorities who have opposed it, but also, also by a rival Aboriginal group um, who's, um, who, who I think really didn't want it returned. And the, the Land Rights Act gave permission to the rival group to, um, to, to care for Dara country. They managed to get round this by skirting the Land Rights Act altogether. Interesting tactic. You see, the land was, it was um, being developed by enormous state authority who had control of about uh, 350 hectares of land in Western Sydney being opened up for housing. So what the community did was to, or the, the leaders, and they were you know, highly educated direct leaders, PhDs and law degrees and so on, were able to persuade the housing authority, can we have our land back? Here are, here are, here are our, our antecedents, our roots are here, our families, um, particularly all going, going all the way back to the famous uh, Darug founder, Lady uh, Maria Locke. Uh, if we trace their antecedents back to her, can we have the land back and we can demonstrate it? And the, uh, the State Housing Authority said, well, why not? <laughs> they weren't interested in, in what the Land Rights Act said, who was the, who was the legal claimant. These people said, well, why not? Let's do it. So they did. And so there was a, a very happy day in um, uh, about three years ago when that land was returned to the community. Um, speeches by many people, by the Dara community was, it's been an ongoing issue for years and years and years. But anyway, I think that's enough to say, I think I've probably used up my 10 minutes already, um, which is to say that the, the rest, the restitution of land back to back, of country, back to people who formerly had associations with very close associations <coughs> is often uh, fraught with legal difficulties. I mean, it's, I, I imagine it's declared an Aboriginal place now under New South Wales law, which doesn't actually, that's capital A, capital P, but it doesn't, um, doesn't really give them very much protection, some kind of recognition, that's about it. Um, so um, there's probably two or three hundred videos on that website of people returning to country with me or other members of the, of the research team. Do have a look because it's, um, it's something that um, it, it, it's, people are looking at often uh, spiritual connection with country as, and the physical memories associated with country are sometimes not taken to be um, as significant as they can be until you get back there and you'll suddenly realize how similar as they are. So I think it'll do um, uh, because I've done my time. So we'll get back to Ruby at this point. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Peter. Thanks for those um, stories and the compelling intersections between you know, personal stories and larger questions of you know, community country, connections with country, and then the very practical and difficult questions they often raise to do with, with law and with ongoing you know, policies and disputes. Um, I think it would be great, uh, someone's already asked, can we share the link in the chat, please? And I, I'm sure that um, will be made available. And I do encourage people to have a look uh, at that link because it does bring to that, quest that point I raised earlier about history increasingly being communicated beyond just the written word but ways in which people are telling it and speaking it using a range of media. And I think that's a perfect segue to our next uh, speakers, um, Lorena, Michael and Eliza, who will be talking about uh, their project, um, which is a team-based project at UNE. And I'll hand over to you, Lorena, to, to give us um, the title of that project and to explain it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ruby. Um, thanks, Peter and Ruth and Anne and everyone for um, inviting us on to, to this panel um, and to share our research with you guys. Um, before uh, we begin, 
I would like to culturally introduce myself and the Tarragar um, researchers, Eliza and Michael, by first acknowledging country and paying our respects to the Anawan, on whose country we work and live, and their neighbours who share the caring for this country, the Gambangi, Dungadi, Banbai and Gomorrah. We'd also like to acknowledge the knowledge holders, elders and community members of other countries who are with us today. We're online, but we're also on country. We acknowledge Aboriginal sovereignty of country that was never ceded. We respectfully acknowledge our resilience and resistance, our strength and continuous connections to our lands and territories, waters, cultures and languages. We pay our respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. We'd also like to take a moment to remember those knowledge holders and elders who have recently joined our ancestors, especially those knowledge holders and elders who have been a big part of our community research projects and projects for and by um, the Academy about Aboriginal people, our histories, languages and cultures. We now ask that we respectfully just take a moment, um, a moment of silence um, to remember those. always remembered, never forgotten, and forever in our hearts. Now, um, I've, um, I've got a short little PowerPoint presentation and the way in which we do our presentations is we have a yarn. Um, so we yarn about country. Uh, we yarn about country pretty much um, every time we have an opportunity, if it's on Zoom or face-to-face -face and in this age of COVID-19, most of our yarning is done um, uh, by, via Zoom. And we re both myself, Michael and Eliza regularly catch up um, to um, just talk about our research, but also troubleshoot and worry about the gray area and um, worry for our family and community members who are being ravaged in Western New South Wales and along the Songlines communities, which our research um, uh, now uh, work, the work we do in Western New South Wales. Um, I've just, um, I've just got to, if, if you can just bear with me, um, just for a sec, there's the wood guy that just dropped my wood off. Um, and I've just got to get my mum to move my car so he can come in. So um, Eliza, if you can just take it over just for two minutes, and then I'll come back with a with a short story to share mm -hmm. with you. Sorry about that. <laughs> He's just knocked on my door. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to talk about, folks. Um, um, Eliza, hey. maybe you could introduce the Taragara project and explain what it yeah, is. Yeah, I'll do that. Excellent suggestion. Um, so Taragara, Michael, Lorena and myself have been working together for um, probably eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of the university, I was Deputy Director of Grad Studies at UNE and Michael and Lorena are academics. Um, and together we worked extensively on building an Indigenous um, graduate research pro program at the university. Um, I retired recently, which is making me extraordinarily happy, folks. Um, but we needed a way of um, including, so we kind of sat in what we tend to call the grey space, which is between the academy and the community. Um, I was a university administrator, not an academic. Michael and Lorena were academics. Uh, and we found that we were continually operating in a space that wasn't purely academic and wasn't purely community. Um, and we also, the three of us, had a big commitment to ensuring that community um, elders, cultural knowledge holders and communities were able to lead research as opposed to us leading research. So uh, we arrived at, um, Lorena did really, um, Lorena suggested to us one day that we form an Aboriginal corporation. Um, so the Taragara Aboriginal Corporation sits, uh, is its own entity. It sits out completely outside of the, um, the university under the Aboriginal Corporations um, Act. Uh, but Taragara Research sits in the university. We're currently established as a research group in the School of Humanities in the Faculty of... Um, uh, everyone's changed their names again recently, so I'm not entirely sure... Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences is the current faculty. So Taragara Research sits in, in, um, in the school and faculty as a research centre, but we also sit in community um, and, and in, in the, with the communities that, that, that we work with. 
and where the, one of our key goals is to leverage university research so that it responds to community aspirations around research. Um, and we are, I think what is distinctive about Taragara is that we are led by Aboriginal cultural knowledge holders. So we don't formulate projects and take them out to community. We go to community, talk about the sorts of histories and materials and cultural knowledge that, that they believe we need, to, we need to make the subject of university research projects. Um, and then we work with them to develop those projects. But I'll hand back to Lorena now. Thanks, Eliza. About what Taragara did. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so just to, um, to uh, share a short story um, with you a young, about a young person. In a yarn and circle on Zoom, a young person is listening to the presenter speak about country, culture and kin. The presenter then asks participants to culturally introduce themselves. Conrad muses to himself, gee, I wish I'd gone on to those fishing trips with Nana and Auntie, but I was too busy playing Fortnite, going to the nightclub and hanging out with my friends. The presenter then asks, okay, Conrad, you're up. Like a roo in headlights, Conrad is stunned silent, but his thoughts are racing. Who am I? What's my totem? What are my song lines? He hesitates and settles on, g'day, I'm Conrad Roy Kelly from Burke. Happy to be here. Great story. Thanks for sharing. Um, senior cultural knowledge holders. Under shady old gum tree on the banks of the Barker, two elders have come together to yarn, paint and fish as they've always done. But lately they've been worrying about lots of things. They lament to each other. This COVID problem is making it harder for us to gather on country A. Yeah, finally the world is quiet, but who is listening? When can our young, when can our young ones join us here? How are we gonna tell our stories and pass our knowledge on before it's too late? So this is, this is a problem made worse by, by COVID-19. And one of the reasons that we developed a, a project um, right in the thick of COVID-19 in 2020 called Yarning Online on Country. And we thought that this would be um, one of the community projects that we would talk about, as well as our um, major ARC project called Songlines of Country, which interweaves. So, Yarn and Online on Country gave us the opportunity um, to remain um, connected to our communities, to our elders and to country um, as part of the Songlines communities and to also develop and um, share creative um, components and uh, also support artists around New South Wales and the interstate to um, who were suffering the most um, during the peak of COVID-19 in 2020. And so we, we came together with artists, with elders um, from Narangiri country, uh, from uh, uh, Niamba and Barkindji country in, in Burke. And uh, we connected together and created this space that we call Yarning Online and Country, which is a cultural space for our communities, for our artists, and um, where we can come and share knowledge and stories and um, and some of our cr creative outlets. So um, that's one of the projects that we wanted to share and talk with you. And the way in which we um, talk about our projects is to really have a yarn. So both Michael and Eliza will, um, we, we will just piggyback on each other and, and pretty much have a yarn um, to explain our project to you. And I've just got a short um, PowerPoint presentation. So I'll bring that up. Just give me a sec. Um, it's probably, I can share. I just got to share my screen. So we just got about seven, um, seven slides. And so um, Yarn and Online on Country um, came at the, the peak of COVID-19. And one of the things that we, we have done, and I think I heard Eliza explain um, as I came back into the room, was that um, 
all of our research projects are um, in response, direct response to, to country and to, to our elders and community people's needs and aspirations. So uh, we, uh, with Yarn and Online on Country, we, we responded immediately. Um, and it was a way in which um, our communities uh, were, were able to stay connected. And um, it was, it, it was an amazing sort of 10, it was a 10 week program uh, that went for, um, uh, initially I started off as a 10 week project, um, project um, with elders in Burke. Um, and we were concerned about the isolation, um, the loneliness of our elders and what would, what could we do um, to support them. And uh, so we developed this project with them. And um, so it was a place for, for elders to come on and share their memory stories and experiences and pass on the knowledge um, and to be able to capture that um, because Indigenous um, peoples are at most at risk and um, we are currently seeing that in Western New South Wales now. And um, our project, Yarn and Online on Country, is um, still been running, has been running this year and um, we are now into stage four, which is Kurapura Pillar Weaving. And that is where uh, the, the elders are now working more with natural fibres. So we are in some of the photographs you see there, we're down by the bark of the Darling River, gathering the spiny sedge. So we're reconnecting to our natural fibres that we weaved with. And um, we started off with raffia and we transitioned um, with uh, Annie Ellen Trevorrow, to, who's a Naranjiri master weaver. Uh, she did a, a four weeks of weaving with us online. And so she reconnected us with the tradition of, of weaving with the spiny sedge. Mm -hmm. And the spiny sedge um, grows. So we connect um, the fourth phase of, of yarn and online, the Kurapura pillar is connecting um, all of those songlines communities. So we're also connected through the plant fiber, the spiny sedge, and you can sp find the spiny sedge. It, it grows all, all along the Darling, um, uh, out to the Coorong and even into um, uh, South Australia, the Adamantna country. So uh, we, uh, we're also following the, the um, spiny sedge as we tell the stories and reconnect to that knowledge and history. Um, Eliza and Michael, if, if there's anything that you wanted to jump in. No, and, no you're doing a great job, Brian. <laughs> um, uh, we, we are, these are our um, songlines communities in just in Western New South Wales, um, where we are focused at the moment because of COVID-19. And uh, these are the connected, we're also connecting our communities um, online and on country and uh, we have been ended this year by, by COVID and we haven't been able to go into those remote and isolated communities because of that. So we're open that um, towards the end of the year or even mm -hmm. early next year, we will start to connect with those communities again. Um, Maybe I'll just say, Rain, can you just flash yep. back to that one? Yep. Just want to draw people's attention to, I'm not sure um, the, the, what's happening in Western New South Wales with COVID is utterly appalling. And of those communities named on that slide, only Woolmaringal is currently COVID free. Uh, so if people are able to assist the communities, you, if you Google, you'll find a lot of GoFundMe campaigns that are being run by community. Yeah. Um, you can donate to those community, um, those communities. I think that would be um, a very, uh, it would be a way of assisting them deal with what is an escalating crisis and scares, just scares us uh, beyond any capacity of mine to describe it. So, Ren, just. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's, um, I was in Western New South Wales. I've only just returned to Armidale. Um, so it's very, very scary. Um, and to, to be out there um, and to, to know now that, um, and to see our communities ravaged by COVID-19. And we don't even know what the next weeks um, will bring, um, but the numbers are climbing each day. Um, mm. So yeah, any, we, we call them um, uh, goodies bags. Um, so when we send things out to our communities, we call them goodies bags. 
Um, so if there's something that you want to um, send, uh, we send goodies, uh, goodie bags to our um, elders. So they would be um, raffia, yeah, yeah. Um, macrame um, materials, anything, creative art stuff, things that would also keep our elders um, uh, um, active and um, to do a few few things that, um, you know, other than watching Netflix day in and day out. So um, I, a lot of our elders are also really, really like the diamond art, the crystal art. Um, so a lot of our elders in Western New South Wales enjoy that, the colour, colour, colour code and things. So anything you can do to help would be really greatly appreciated. Uh, now my slide is just not moving. So um, connecting online on country. So we um, we came we come together every Tuesday um, from ten to to um, one o'clock, and our our projects have, have been funded um, continuously since last year. Um, so we're very fortunate to keep this this project going, and in in its various iterations. And so we um, we develop the culturally appropriate projects and programs that are responsive to our communities and their needs and aspirations. And we also use the cultural methodologies, um, which is what we call Muramani. So we, um, Mura is the history and knowledge of country. And connecting now, um, Mura. So Mura is the history and knowledge. It is our song lines and it is our history. Um, so country is history. And um, these online, um, cultural spaces, they're spaces of cultural exchange um, and knowledge sharing, storytelling. Um, and it also, the online space is also for, for artists and the artists that we've worked with, um, the, our elders, is, is the marketing and economic opportunities that it can present for, for artists. And it's a way for our communities to maintain continuity and connection um, for our um, culture and kinship and um, history and uh, communities. It's also um, a place where it's capacity building um, between and across all generations. So um, we are upskilling also our, our elders in how to use Zoom um, and not to be afraid to use online platforms. And what we find with our elders each week, if we're not on, online or there's some computer um, issue, um, they're always saying, well, we can't, we need to be able to connect with you. So they expect us to be online each and every week. Um, and again, it's, it's using new mediums to tell um, our ancient knowledge and stories, as we've always done for millennia. And we're doing it in a new way, as we've always done, and ad adapting um, to the next age, um, which is the digital age. Uh, and this is... Um, uh, connecting to um, country through kinship, so everything in um, in Aboriginal culture is interconnected, interrelated, and um, and like the spiny sedge, it is it has its own law and knowledge and history, and we have through yarn and online on country have connected to the to that fiber, and uh, have we're what we call um, our bend, so we. Um, create, find a space um, uh, on a river bend, um, and that becomes the place where we regenerate, replant, and um, harvest um, the spiny sedge. So, in each of um, our songlines communities, they will have our bend somewhere, um, and as part of the regeneration of the spiny sedge, and to reconnect with the the, the natural fibre, but also the weaving techniques of, of Western New South Wales and the Songlines communities is to um, have that place where we can go um, and uh, harvest the, the plant to, to be able to weave the baskets in the traditional form um, and the tradition, using the traditional techniques. And so um, uh, we connect um, to country through the kinship. So we're um, through people, culture, language, and it is our identity. And uh, country is our history. And I think that is my last slide. And um, this is just really um, 
some photos of our participants, our local our elders and, and community members in uh, in Burke. And um, this is kind of the our aim, our values um, of what we as Tarragara are wanting to achieve through our research and community projects. And it's about the knowledge transmission. And it's so um, it's so, so important now with um, COVID ravaging our communities and time is of the essence and we need to be able to find ways to um, harvest, if you like, that knowledge from our elders before it's too late. And, um, and trying to find innovative ways to be able to work with our elders, even in the thick of COVID-19. So we want them to change lives, you know, even if it's 50, 10 participants in our workshops to 50 to 100 to 1,000. So the ripple effect of um, uh, being able to uh, obtain that um, knowledge and be able to um, transmit it or transform it into a user new media to be able to share that with um, current and future generations. Um, and I think we're in a time where that, that is all um, possible with technology. And sustainability um, is the ethics and value of Aboriginal knowledge. And to be connected is also connectivity in Western New South Wales, having the internet, having Wi-Fi um, is inclusivity. Um, so you, in order, and it is, um, and this is the, the last one is re, redefining con, the concept of remoteness. So, um, and Michael, um, you can talk on this um, if, if you like. And okay. it's, so with, it's not a, it's no, with, um, with technology, remoteness is now not a deficit. And Michael, if you can add to that. that yep. um, I, I think um, coming on to the uh, Taragara research, um, uh, project um, where communicating it is that um, uh, recognizing your and I mean it in the sense that um, uh, when we um, the aunties uh, we're on their country uh, and I suppose that um, from the uh, discussions and the talks and the uh, opportunities we have uh, to uh, talk, um, uh, I recognise um, they're not being no longer remote. Uh, from where, up, uh, no longer remote from um, uh, in that uh, uh, communication. Uh, even though the fact that I live and work on um, uh, Anawan country, when we go to um, uh, meet um, or uh, catch up with the aunties uh, in Berg, we're on their country. So, um, um, uh, remote kind of mm -hmm. like um, uh, a, a concept of um, distance, uh, because it kind of removes uh, those kind of barriers prior to COVID, uh, where face to face. Uh, was pretty much um, uh, the way in which uh, most interaction and engagement or coming together uh, uh, is uh, so often uh, the way in which uh, education uh, research uh, has, has kind of been conducted. So um, the, the idea of um, redefining um, remoteness um, has in many ways kind of been uh, generated by uh, the issues we now currently face, where uh, COVID had virtually um, uh, uh, covered, uh, communities indoors, but um, we're still able uh, to communicate, uh, still able to uh, meet up uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, I think um, uh, in some ways too, that um, this is probably going to become uh, a feature uh, to the way in which um, education uh, and research uh, will be uh, 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 in, in many ways um, delivered uh, uh, in the future as well. Thanks, Michael. Um, right. Liza, did you want to add anything? Um, um, only, the only thing I'd add is that um, I think 
we, we have some issues that we need to deal with. And one of those is connectivity. Um, the, the internet accessibility of those communities is extremely difficult. And it's one of the big problems that we have. And it kind of, it becomes a wicked problem because it kind of falls through the funding guidelines as well. So what we've noticed, because we're able to apply for both community funding and more kind of classic university research funding, is quite often those grants um, don't include things like computers and internet um, access and that kind of thing. So one of our roles from a university research point of view, I think, will be to advocate that for Indigenous programming in uh, in rem remote communities, um, hmm. uh, that that those things can can be should just routinely be included in in grant monies, and then those those resources should be left in communities so that we actually are increasing um, the capacity of those communities to be online. Yeah. Um, so that is that is a um, that's a real problem outside of, I don't know how many of you, um, probably there's people here know this already, but outside of metropolitan areas and major regional centres, internet coverage is extremely patchy. Indeed, for most of our field trips, we don't have internet access. Um, it's just not, it's just not available. So that is a, a big problem. Um, and one that we will work very, that we have some ideas about how we're going to overcome that. So it's not going to stop us. Uh, but it is a, it's a real issue, as is working with elders and technical capacity. Um, they grew up in a very different world to the world of smartphones and laptops and iPads and, you know, Zooming. Uh, so we also have to, to, to deal with that. Um, but it's, it's well worth it. The, the, the response of the communities, we were talking last night about uh, when we're online with our communities, um, how we become just naturally part of the conversation and they've, they've adjusted to having us beaming in, um, in incredibly well. Uh, and it's, it's a real, it's a real honor to be able to be part of these conversations. So, you know, we looked, yeah, as Lorena pointed out, we're looking to increase, increase our capacity to, to do that. That'd be it. Yeah, and I, and um, thanks, Eliza. One of the other things that Yarn and Online on on Country um, does, and particularly that we're in um, when when we started the project in in 2020, a lot of um, service providers couldn't get into our communities. So we came in at a right time to um, meet other organisations' KPIs. So the AMS didn't get their funding, the local funding um, at the time to run their mums and bubs program. And so Yarn and uh, Online on Country um, we, uh, also catered for the needs of the mums and bubs at the AMS. And so they joined with us, um, the local um, preschool um, with their cultural projects um, and cultural connections. They weren't able to bring elders into the preschool. Um, so we um, invited the, the preschool online with us um, so that we, when the elders were out on, on the river um, cooking Johnny Cakes and um, weaving, uh, the preschoolers beamed in. And so the elders gave them a tour of the river and um, talked to them about Johnny Cake making and they were cooking they made their own fire and they cooked their all their, their meals. So we call all the food that we cooked during our lesson, our sessions are called deadly feeds. So the elders were, were able to connect through the online debate, um, and through Zoom and through Yarn and Online on Country with the preschoolers. So um, uh, at the time, Yarn and Online on Country, and we were able to secure other funding um, to keep the project running in 2020. Um, through the local land services, because we also met their KPIs in being able to um, uh, uh, regenerate and um, look after the environment with um, knowledge and history about the spiny sedge. And so the, these online platforms and, and working, working on country and working online was I, we were able to, to get funding um, for, our, for, for, for this project to continue. And we've we've recently um, received an heritage grant funding for to keep it going for throughout 2021. Um, and um, now with COVID, 
we, we will get an extension and will, will take us into 2022. And um, so that's that's one one way of um, yarn and online and country have given not only service prov other serv service providers um, the opportunity to be online um, and and to meet their KPIs. Um, it, it was also, um, they've also had direct contact with our participants. So we also had a captive audience for other um, service providers like Alzo who would pop in um, because they had elders sitting in a room um, and um, kind of like um, Big Brother and Intruders because we'd be online and then we'd, we'd, somebody would turn up in our sessions and it's like, who is this person? Um, but that was an opportune time for other services to come in and talk to elders about um, some of the things they're doing. Um, and that's one of the one of the things that we also need to iron out that um, and to work with other service providers that um, if they need, it's a negotiated space. Um, and yeah. while we look after the needs and um, to support our elders and community members, uh, that is their time. That's their quality time and their space. Um, so people need to request an invitation in rather than just popping in, um, bobbing in and out, um, as a lot of people do. But of course, um, we have been learning along the way what's appropriate, what's culturally appropriate, and what the elders want. And so we've also changed. We've we also um, allow and um, respond to if the elders are now working because of COVID-19 and they can do crama, um, macrame in their own home. So um, you can see the elders there with their macrame. So they're making angan baskets, but it's a, they can't harvest the, the spiny sedge um, because of the, 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 the river was flooded at one point um, and they can't gather now. So they can do macrame in, the own, in their own homes. Um, so um, we well, can't wait to see um, the finished product, um, but they will pop into Maranooka and get more materials as they need it um, as well. So we do send um, materials back as much as we can um, with the funding that we've got. Um, Thank you. Um, Lorena, I, I just, I need to stop in just because for my... That's all right. I was, one, I was hoping you would. <laughs> I, I also didn't want to because I think what we've seen on the chat, and I'm sure we all agree, what we're seeing here is such a positive uh, and wonderful project. Congratulations. It intercepts so many uh, different and overlapping um, areas of knowledge, of country, of history, that we are learning here that there are no distinguishing clear, you know, there are no distinctions between those, uh, those things and that you are engaging and adapting immediately to problems that are here and now, but that also have a deep history. Um, thank you. Uh, while you've addressed some serious and um, difficult problems, you've mentioned flooding, you've mentioned COVID, you have also shown us an incredible ability to adapt positively to that. And if there's any time when we need to learn to focus on the positives, and I speak personally here as well, um, it's now. I'm going to turn now to Anne McGrath, um, who's our final speaker, and then we'll uh, look forward to getting um, some questions. And uh, yes, please, you can post your questions now, um, and I'll look forward to, to uh, passing them on to the speakers. So thank you over to you, Anne McGrath. Oh, Yuma which is uh, hello in Nunawal Nambri. I'm on Cumbri country here in beautiful Canberra and in lockdown. And, uh, and I think my talk is going to be along a different kind of trajectory. It's a hard act to follow these two um, talks that went before me. Uh, and, but, but I love the echo of these words in the title, telling history through country. And, uh, and I also welcome our collaborating scholars who I see are online and also there are people from all around the, the country of Australia and also overseas. So fantastic that there's such wide interest. And I also congratulate Laura and Ruth for, for organizing such a great program. And it's a, great to be working with this um, 
uh, Environmental History Centre uh, that Ruth is the director of as well. And of course, um, Lorena is, um, has been a very important contributor to our Research Centre for Deep History. She's on the um, Indigenous Advisory Board and, and the main um, Centre Advisory Board as well. So as you've already heard, um, country has taken on a special meaning in Australia. And, and we, we can learn from the elders who have passed on the wonderful cultural legacies and the important deep history story for future generations. And the generosity in sharing this with non-Indigenous Australians is um, quite astonishing and moving as have the previous speakers' presentations been. So country has taken on this special meaning uh, about unceded land, sovereignty, belonging, knowledge, making selves, making everything. It goes far out to sea and sky and beneath the ground, the animate and the inanimate. Country is everything, past and present. Country is all embracing of humanity and everything in its midst. And um, it plays the role as we've already heard of a speaker itself, as a narrator, it speaks to people and offers revelations. A book entitled Song Cycles by the Gaywu group of women, Yolnu people, they explain, country is the keeper of the knowledge we share with you. Country gives the knowledge. It guides us and teaches us. Country has awareness. It knows and is part of us. Country is generative. It is the way humans and non-humans co-become, the way we emerge together, have always emerged together and will always emerge together. So country is creative force dictating values and practical guidelines for living, explaining the world, it, it, interpretation and embodied practices, people sing, dance and enact rituals of country. So does country have a time zone uh, I think we know the answer to that question. It's a bit of a rhetorical question. Uh, it is, of course, the present moment, the past and everything in between. It's where history happens. It is an actor. It is a historical agent. And although it may speak, one has to learn how to listen. If country is an ontology of effect or emotion and immersion, um, it would appear, appear to stand in direct contrast to the old traditional ways of thinking about history and science and Western knowledge production, which has um, emphasized objectivity quite a lot. And then in this post-truth age, there's been much more of an openness to appreciate different ways of understanding the world. And I'd argue understanding the, the deep past. Uh, so does telling history through country simply re-enchant the past, making it somehow magic and more about belief and contributing further to what we see are also some of the concerns about this post-truth world? Um, in regards to the deep past, does it remove the possibility of scientific or historical objectivity? And I'm playing devil's advocate here because I don't think I believe in historical objectivity at all. But I suppose I'm, I'm summing up the way that a lot of people think about facts and evidence. So is telling history through country, country intrinsically opposed to how the history discipline sees itself or defines itself? And I go back to when I was starting a PhD in history, I was researching the role of Aboriginal people in the cattle industry up in the Northern Territory in the Kimberleys. And I met a wonderful Gurindji woman um, who was living on Mirawongadron country, Amy Laurie. She'd been a drover and we drove around in a borrowed car and she would point out to me, oh, that hill, that's Barramundi dreaming. Oh, that one. And then she'd go through all the fish. And I was just thinking, oh, how much non-Indigenous people miss out on the richness of travel through country and how um, narrow and superficial our understanding of country is. I mean, I didn't know the name of the hill. It meant nothing to me. There was nothing familiar or to do with my family. Whereas for her, the hill was like a brother or sister and, and you know, it was just a totally different experience. Um, so... Uh, the other thing she said was things like, oh, that tree is my countryman. And then, of course, we went up to the Argyle Dam and she said, that's, you know, they drowned my country as though, you know, some poor grandparent had passed away because they'd been drowned. 
uh, and she remembered all the trees and everything that was there. Uh, a theme which Peter Reed would remember well from his, um, his book about be belonging and, and inundated lost country. Um, so th this taught me a lot. And, uh, and I also remember the lovely freshly caught fish we ate afterwards. <laughs> I still remember the taste of that fish and, uh, and, and how meaningful just everything was as I traveled with old um, poor Amy Laurie. And she had an amazing sense of humor too. And I suppose I, ever since then, I've always thought, well, what are the Aboriginal ways of remembering the past? How do they practice history? How, you know, it seems to be that many people, Aboriginal people are generous enough to share that history. So I actually in the 1980s applied for a grant from IATSIS to look at Aboriginal ways of thinking about history, but it was knocked back. And then I found out that Peter Reed was the chair of the committee. And in fact, <laughs> and, I, and he explained to me that he didn't know what I was on about. And I must say, I probably hadn't explained it well, and I probably didn't really know how to go about it. So it's amazing to see like Lorena and this wonderful project that she's running, the Taragara project and, and how people now are working out ways of going about it. Sorry, Peter, I had to have a go at you about that when I remembered back then. Um, but since then, uh, we made a film with uh, Gordon Briscoe, who was mentioned before, and also um, various Native American scholars, and Sonia Smallacombe, who'll be speaking tomorrow in our next um, webinar tomorrow. Um, and we made a film called A Frontier Conversation. And the aim of this trip around the Northern Territory that Sonia actually organised was to try to find out what Aboriginal people thought about history and whether there were connections with Native American ideas of history. Well, we found that they, th they thought history was really, really boring. And um, it was a place <laughs> of exclusion and it was just about white people. So I could say a lot more about that, but I think that what that reveals is that history was um, either boring and um, there's a lot being written now about Aboriginal history, but a lot of it is history of rupture and trauma. And, uh, and it still usually only goes back 200 plus years. So I learned lo a lot more about the deep Aboriginal past and learning through country when I started doing work um, at Lake Mungo. Um, and here they had this program of discovery ranges where Aboriginal people actually teach visitors, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, about their ancestors, about the past, and they also see it coming up but through the erosion. You know, an environmental historian would say, you know, the wind is um, eroding this whole landscape because uh, sheep destroyed it with the soldier settler farms and so on. Whereas these local people would say, you know, the, the wind is um, bringing up the stories of our ancestors to speak to the present and to help us in the present and help bring the world's attention to our suffering too. And, uh, and we realize there is um, not this deep past that's way back and a modern past or a recent co colonizer past, we realize they're all very intersecting. And so hence we have worked with the Mari Mari Nyampa and Bakanji people um, of the Willandra Lakes area to think about um, uh, how that story may be told in maps. And we've actually been working with them about the, um, in a sort of what we call a Mungo map uh, and you can look up our web website, which is re.anu.edu.au uh, to see some images and find out more about that Mungo map. And that's actually about their um, grandparents, their great grandparents. And it's through the map telling history through country because they know where every single thing happens, you know, where their um, grandfather took, uh, was a drover, where um, people helped build the railway. Um, where people were forced to go on to a mission or stolen from by the police and the protectors, you know, so there's, there's these recent stories of the recent past and um, it's, we don't want to like fetishize the ancient past as opposed to people's experiences that they're still living through today. Uh, but at Mungo, people are passionate about sharing their past and uh, this was the film we made, Message from Mungo, which you can now watch free because it's on SBS streaming. 
but on the front is Alice Kelly, and she was the great fighter for her rights. She wanted to hear what the scientists knew, and she wanted to teach them what she knew. So it's this amazing story of sharing knowledge. She used to sit through these meetings with the scientists, and it's rather legendary. She had a Bible on one side of her, a dictionary on the other. So if the scientists used any word she didn't understand, she would look it up. And then, of course, she'd cite the Bible about the kind of values they were claiming to um, follow. And, uh, and so you can go on a discovery tour with Indigenous rangers who will teach you um, and share their knowledge of this part of the world. And, uh, and of course, there's many places where you can now have that opportunity, um, like, for example, the Welcome to Country, and there's also social media sites that teach you about Indigenous businesses. And through our uh, Marking Country Digital Deep History Atlas, which Lorena knows about, uh, we will be um, hoping to promote Indigenous businesses further who, take in, who, who run Indigenous-led tours of country. So I guess, uh, I'm not sure if I have much time left, Rebe. How much time do I have left? Well, if you could wrap up in a minute, that would be <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yes. So I guess what I want to say is just how important Indigenous knowledge is to understanding things. Like, for example, at Mungo, these, uh, this amazing human trackway from at least 20,000 years ago, the Pleistocene, was found. And... Uh, and it was um, first spotted, uh, so all the news items went, by Mary Pappen Jr. But Mary was very keen to say, you know, it was special for her to have this revelation of the ancestors speaking to her through these footprints. But she didn't want, want to claim to be the first to see it because the sort of nature of these revelations was that her elders had also seen them before and some felt it was secret knowledge they didn't want to talk about it they warned their kids not to walk in these footsteps and and then they invited the Pintabi trackers to come and help um, interpret what was going on in those footprints and of course if that is a science like it was quite clear they had a refined sophisticated way of interpreting what those people um, were doing um, these people were running to catch a kangaroo. One man only had one leg and he had a stick and he was running very fast, much faster than I can run. And, um, and, and uh, one woman had a baby on her hip and was moving it from one hip to the other. You know, so that is a very sophisticated science that was able to be combined with the um, Western um, scientific measurements that were also going on about those um, footprints. So I guess I would argue that when the various knowledge streams speak to each other, as in this example, the human stories of the people of the deep past and present can potentially become more richly known. And we're all learning from the elders and these passed on traditions. And as more indigenous um, historians and scientists come on board, they will be in a very excellent position to combine these knowledges in ways that we can all greatly benefit from as a nation. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think what we've, we can now encourage um, everyone uh, here to, all the participants to, to ask questions. Um, I have some questions on the q and I've got questions on the chat. I'll be looking at both, so whatever works for you. Um, yeah, look, it, it's what we've seen in this, presentation is well what I'm what I'm hearing I guess I've written down on my doodle pad here is the word listening you know it, what what I see here is we have myself Peter and and um, you know <laughs> reminiscing on early funding grants and I think what we've noticed here is that we've been working and and I was a student um, of Peter's and uh, I was at ANU when uh, Anne was not one of my teachers, but you know I feel that um, you know I've I've learned my my time as a researcher the most important thing is to listen um, to Indigenous peoples. I work in a field where for over a hundred years um, non-Indigenous peoples said that the Palawa people were extinct, and the more you listen the more wrong that is. Um, today, we have been listening to what Lorena is explaining to us 
is it's not just listening, it's about creating opportunities that the people who need to be heard are heard. Her project is facilitating that. It's also drawing to limits in that. Um, these are very practical and problematic limits where people don't have connectivity on country. Um, Peter Reid pointed to another absence where you can return to country, but there's no sign. Gordon says there's nothing to show um, of, of my past. Um, and so, and yet Peter created the opportunity for that listening to happen and is sharing it. So there's, we are seeing gaps, we're seeing problems, but we're also seeing the positives in which people are working hard to create those opportunities. Um, the chat and the Q&A is showing us that people are responding to that positive uh, messaging. Um, and some of the questions have actually been addressed um, that, you know, the question from Elizabeth asks, are elders easily adopting uh, to Zoom? And I think, Lorna, you, you talked about that and about um, how that learning is happening. Um, Jacinda Walsh asks an interesting question, um, and it was one that was going through my mind too, Lorena, when I was watching, um, is that, that we have seen many of the elders are women in the projects, uh, women making, um, the macrame you mentioned, um, and we're wondering if, uh, Jacinda asks, um, is the project engaging with Indigenous men? Um, in positive ways as well. So I'll pass that over to you and to your team to, to respond to. Uh, well, yes, uh, and one of the reasons why Michael is also a part of our research team. And um, Michael, have you got your beautiful basket, um, Andy? Um, so we, uh, Weaven is both a male and female um, uh, practice. And um, so men and women made baskets, they made um, nets and it's a shared um, production. And so we, we have been talking to, to our, um, as we've been doing the songlines and in our songlines community is to talk to, to our elders. Um, they sit back a, um, a little bit. Um, the women are the ones that um, in, in Western New South Wales are the movers and shakers. Um, so um, the elders that we, uh, we work with directly, um, that's Michael's beautiful basket. Um, so we, we share that um, with um, our elders. He's shown it to um, our male elders as well and to encourage them to reconnect um, and to join a group. And uh, we were open to do that with this year's um, uh, program. But because of um, COVID has ended that, it's stopped us sort of going back into community to, to talk. But one of the we're open that um, with with Michael um, on board um, that and they can see the things that he's made that um, you know it's it's not it's not just women's business it's men's business too and um, mm. we want them we want to encourage and create a space um, and and these are cultural spaces so um, uh, the the elders will then determine if there needs to be a male um, online space. And um, and whether they would um, they want us to to come in online or that might be um, managed by by Michael um, and this is the way in which we do songlines it's it's a long cultural and kinship um, uh, and on the social aspects of each and every community so we will identify the community will identify where they need um, where they would like. Um, their group to be established, whether it's in an organisation, um, it might be in a community centre. Uh, what we ask of, of our partner organisations is the uh, th free use of their internet access. So it's usually done in their conference room. Um, and then when we're on country with our community elders, um, and be, we, we also got... Um, uh, on country coordinators so that we employ on country coordinators to be on on the ground working with our elders and yeah, so we um, have external wi-fi devices but yeah we're open to uh, get more um, male elders um, on board 
So there's a constant interplay of every opportunity to bring different ages and different peoples together. I have a question um, from Kate. Um, you've mentioned the mums and bubs group, Lorena, and you've mentioned elders. Um, I'm very in want, Kate wants to know what about a teenage space? You did mention that story early on in your talk of the young guy who, who you know, was like stuck in the headlights. Um, is there a is there a, a, a focus on teenagers? The, the, we have young people that work on our songlines projects. So they are our, we, we call them our community liaisons. So they work with our elders, they support our elders, um, they make cups of teas for our elders, um, and they're also learning. So it's the trans it's it's the transition of knowledge as it would be done um, in a, a natural community setting. So we've set that up and replicated in it, it's been um, uh, in a kind a natural process for us and mm. wherever. So in order to do the song lines, we have to have young people on our on our team. So our young people are employed as on country coordinators, as is our um, elders, and um, all of our artists. We employ our artists to run um, and facilitate workshops, and we have community liaisons and their support people. So we've had young men um, involved, um, and one of the things with um, our bend. Uh, with working on the river, elders have identified that, you know, it's been, the rivers because of the um, flooding, the erosion, um, it's too steep or there's too many bindies. And so the elders said, well, how can we get down there? You know, we need to get these young people out here to, to um, clean up the site. So we want to identify, so they've identified the place. And that's the next step is to get, they will identify which elder, which young people that they can, um, as we've traditionally have done, um, is to identify who is the person they want to work with. And we employ those young people to clear the area of the bindies and to support the elders to be able to come online. Um, so the idea of Yarn and Online on Country, although we're at the moment working um, in, part, in partner organisations because of internet, poor internet access in a lot of our participants' homes, we were open that... Um, young people would have been able to assist their their nans and, and mums to come online with us and because they're the ones who are, who are technology savvy. Yeah, I know that and feeling, yeah. So, <laughs> um, but that's not the case in Western, as you know, and as you've seen with COVID-19, yeah. our houses are overcrowded. Um, so yeah. it's not always, um, uh, you can't find a quiet space to work. Um, so there's 10 people in, in one house or... Um, yeah. And it's way too noisy. So elders, we then uh, sought partnership um, with organisations so the elders can also have some respite and to come together and have some quiet time for themselves. And so uh, that's what um, the cultural space within the organisation, that's their space. Um, and when they come online, that's their space too. And sometimes we have gotten young people who come in and pop in um, who will say hello and they're just walking through the um, room to see their nana or to... Yeah. Um, well, you know, as I've been speaking to you, you wouldn't know, everyone, that I've had two young people pop in and wave at me and do some TikTok dances through the window. Yeah. I managed <laughs> to stay focused. And I think what, again, we've seen, Lorena, here is this amazing ability in your project to at every opportunity to think about country, caring for country, caring for community, passing on knowledge and you know it is so um it's so inspiring um i've got i've got some some uh, questions that i think i'd like to field to both peter and Anne because they are big and broad questions about history and imperialism and i'm kind of kind of posting them together here i'm sort of melding a few Elizabeth asks, how many stories have we lost through land change and white imperialism? Well, I mean, that's a massive question, but um, it kind of connects into a question from Maddie who asks that she's curious about how academic traditions of attempting historical objectivity, which you spoke about, and um, she wants to know about how to remedy those. 
And I guess what she's thinking about here is this question more broadly about how history as a discipline is adapting to some of these broader questions. Maddie was curious and why you spoke specifically, and I'm hoping this is a correct interpretation, of you disliking connection to deep history and history through country. I'm not sure if that was a correct interpretation. And Alana asks if she, she was quite interested um, with your response and to um, fetishizing the traditional sense of, um, I'm not, actually, I'm not quite sure how to translate that question in this context. But I guess what we're interested in here, and I think what we're trying to engage with, is how history discipline is changing and trying to adapt to what is a very complex intersection of Indigenous knowledges, scientific knowledges, and ways in which all these things come together on country. Um, so in that very complicated roundabout question, I'll let both of you jump in and whoever might want to go first. I see Anne's not mute, so obviously no. that's you. Okay, well, that is a very perambulating little summary there, Reby. You've done well, though, I think. Um, yeah, it reminds me, look, recently we went up to Quinkin country, the Angnara people up there have a corporation. Um, we went on Indigenous-led tour, um, Jaramali tours, but Johnny Murison. And, um, and, and it was interesting because there's this sense that the local Aboriginal people don't know about what the rock art means anymore in that country because they've been so ruptured and severed and, and put on missions and so on. Um, but, but so I think that uh, a lot of what's been saying, um, uh, th there is this sort of um, fetishizing about authenticity and perhaps also at Mungo, it is about this very, very ancient past. And I think that while that is awe-inspiring and amazing, um, the local um, people, um, Madi Madi Nyampo and Bakanji, were very keen to say to me, hey, actually, we have more recent histories too that haven't yet been told about stolen children. And we're all suffered because of this and we've been forced to live on missions. And, um, and so you could easily sort of think, oh, that right, that's contact history, that's different, I can go to the textbooks for that. Well, no, that is a story in country. That is what I was saying about the Mungo map. They, every little twist in the river bend, um, they have a story about their relatives that happened there and, and they could just look at the map and, and they knew exactly where things had happened. So even what we would see as the more recent past can be told through country equally as the very, very deep past. And I mean, that's the incredible thing about Australia and its history, um, that it's had this incredibly rich human past and if people um, it, are told, oh, you don't know any more about it these days because you don't understand what this rock art means, um, well, people can reconnect and they find different ways of reconnecting with country. Sometimes it is by researching books that European people have written, but how did they write them? Like they wrote them because Aboriginal knowledge holders gave them information, which they, they then put in the books. And so I think we should respect the fact that Aboriginal people have been sharing knowledge and some of that can be reclaimed, you know. So I think that um, that idea of reconnection is living, telling history in country. Telling history in country is a way of reconnecting and keeping country alive. And, um, and yeah, so let's get away from those ideas that history is lost. Sorry, I was mute. I think that that notion of rupture and loss, um, which, you know, that, that broad question, how many stories have we lost? Uh, we could flip it and say, how many stories have, are we able to regain and reconnect to? And I think, Peter, that's what um, uh, Uncle Gordon was doing there. And what Anne pointed out was the stories are not all in the deep, deep past. They're also stories about stolen generations. And you going back with Uncle Gordon is one of those moments. Um, do you think, Peter, that there'd be an opportunity uh, to put, to, 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 to mark country in ways that Gordon would like? Just unmute before you. 
Okay. Um, oh yes, of course, and uh, that is that is happening a lot now. Um, it's a continuing process um, of rec recognizing indigenous history, and where it happened too. You know, if you walk around the opera house, there's the very PC. Yes, we have a we have probably half a dozen um, acknowledgements in the pavement there, little plaques of famous indigenous people. You know, we've got Udra Nunakal, for instance, and um, probably um, and then we'll bother. But where are the local indigenous people from Sydney? How come they're not there? I'd love to see George Jonica Williams having a plaque in, in Palmer Street or uh, Victoria Street in, uh, in up, up in the Cross because he's a local hero and local identity. Um, but these things are so, yes, it's, it's what we've got to work on now is not just getting indigenous um, memories on plaques, but local people in local places. I think that's the next step. It is um, frightening how much has been lost, though. I was just thinking there, you know, when someone asked how many stories have been lost, there's an infinite number. And I, I mean, like historical events. When Jay Arthur and I were recording uh, stories in the territory in the 70s of massacres, and I noticed on Lyndall Ryan's map, there's two or three there, of which, which we are the only providers of evidence because we were told that in the 1970s and got photographs and so on. Now, I don't think, like 50 years later, virtually, There'd be young people who would not know anything like that detail or even, even know about it at all because the stories were um, second hand then, sometimes first hand, but mostly second hand. So, uh, the infinite number of stories have been lost. We can just assume that, um, in terms of the, the, uh, the terrible, the violent side of our history, what it's just been, we just have to assume and extrapolate from what we know. Um, and to come back on to Anne's question, yeah, in fact, the um. Uh, it's interesting that, that your application was knocked back, actually. I can't remember, can't understand why it was, though I do remember vaguely making a passionate speech in, in favour of <laughs> in multiplicity. I was struck already at the time how so many so many communities have their this is the frog that the frog that laughed and was tickled and all the water came out in the time of drought. I've been to several places where local elders have said to me, that's our rock, that's where the frog laughs there too. I know we laughed somewhere else. But he laughed here. And that's such an incredibly different way of thinking that no one had in their heads in, say, 1930 when we wrote the definitive history of Australia. Such a profoundly different conception of how the world is, which doesn't follow Western logic at all. Well, as soon as you get to that stage, we're getting into something quite different. And to answer that first question, how has Indigenous um, or historians come to terms with this kind of different kind of thinking? Well, they've been dragged, kicking and and, um, and screaming probably into this way of thinking, but if you keep your antennae out away from Western uh, um, uh, ways, ways of thinking, then we then we begin to understand there's there's perhaps there isn't there isn't really any objectivity that we can think about. I agree with that there. Look, we have um, probably reached the end of our time. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody. And I, I kind of don't want to end this. I'm wondering if we could just squeeze in a couple more minutes because there's a couple of things I wanted to just do in final. One is I would love to look at that basket again, Michael, and wonder if you might give us a little bit of a story about the materials in it. Um, because I think it's such a powerful object. It is a basket that on the one hand, comes <laughs> it that very act of weaving brings country together, brings people together. And Michael, can you unmute and tell us what is woven into that basket? Uh, well, I can say that um, <clears throat> pretty much um, uh, that's that's twenty twenty in a basket. You know, you know, you know, and in many ways the. Um, the little uh, beads and everything that you can see on the side as well, um, kind of relate to um, the weekly uh, kind of um, activities. In, in many ways, as um, Lorena and uh, have um, mentioned, um, when we come together, um, uh, stories and a couple of women in the, um, in the group who kind of generate the stories amongst women. Um, so, in many ways, the basket is, is kind of a product uh, of um, 2020. 
I've yet to put a lid on it, but um, uh, it is that sort of like what to complete um, the journey uh, that I've um, uh, made uh, with Eliza and Lorena, uh, as well as the aunties um, during that period. I, I think it is that, um, I think we were talking about before, um, for me as an artist, uh, it was just an opportunity to um, use uh, a different media because uh, I come from the printmaking uh, photography background uh, as well as film. But um, as Lorena um, has mentioned as well, when you're kind of looking through the archives or you have an opportunity to look at, um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, repositories related to um, cultural capital, uh, that has been created over millennia. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a natural tradition to um, use uh, this opportunity to um, grow and develop uh, my own artistic practice. And um, I think that's part of um, what uh, reciprocity is about uh, in terms of knowing that uh, coming to uh, on my own country uh, opportunities with talking with the aunties as well as uh, participating in the um, basket uh, weaving workshops um, uh, of um, Aunty Trevo um, from South Australia uh, means that um, you, you have means to uh, assist uh, in uh, the revival uh, as well as um, bringing back uh, practices and sharing that uh, uh, as uh, with all the participants, uh, as well as being able to participate uh, uh, in relation to um, the stories as well as the history uh, that becomes part of the object uh, mm. that you create. And in many ways, um, uh, I, I wouldn't, um, at a guess, say that um, the beads are there for, um, you, know, you know, the visually impaired. Uh, but it is that sort of like they kind of act as um, kind of uh, aspects uh, to the stories and memories that I have uh, of 2020. Um, uh, for example, when we did uh, get the opportunity to go out to Berg, uh, as Lorena had um, described, to be on country, um, down on the river, uh, you know, with aunties in the community, um, what well, was. Uh, pretty much, uh, uh, well, I hope, uh, is captured uh, mm. uh, uh, in the story uh, uh, that's kind of woven uh, as mm. well as part of the basket that um, I, I describe now as um, uh, 2020, that was. <laughs> that sort of, well, uh, I wish I could have an object as beautiful that could summarise 2020. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I, think, I think it's a beautiful way of distilling and telling a story. And I think it's something that, you know, you've been able to communicate beautifully to us. And I think it's a beautiful place to end because it literally brings together country, story and community. So thank you. Thank you so no, much. Thank, thank you for you. all that you've taught us. And thank you for your generosity of your team, Lorena. Thank you um, uh, too, to Anne and Peter for, for bringing together your, your vast knowledge and experience with engaging with, with histories and country. I'm gonna hand over back now to Laura and Ruth to, to give us the wrap up. Thank you. Well, uh, what a rich set of papers and a rich discussion. Um, this has been a real treat. Um, thank you everyone who joined us today. Thank you for your questions and your engagement in the chat. I can see um, there's an incredible discussion going on and I hope that continues offline. Um, thank you to all our presenters for such fascinating and rich papers. I think they complemented each other's wonderfully. Um, so we're, we're very grateful to you. And thank you also to Rebe uh, for the really thoughtful and generous way you chaired us today. You're um, welcome. I'll, I'll be sending around an email later today to everyone who registered with the details of the GoFundMe that Eliza mentioned. Um, I encourage you to support communities in Western New South Wales. And the other thing just to let you know is that we'll be having our next deep conversation on space histories uh, on the 4th of November. So stay tuned for that. Um, but just once again, thank you everyone uh, for all your participation and for sharing uh, your wisdom today. Thank you. Nice basket too, Lorena. <laughs> <laughs>